Hi there everyone, we're back at the Royal Society. Rupert Baker's back, the keeper of books, knower of all things about manuscripts and books, and today we've got a very topical collection of papers, haven't we? We have indeed, yes. All right, and we're starting with a new acquisition, something hot in your hands that you've just gotten. Yep, this is something I actually bought when I was uh, working from home. You bought this? Well, with the Royal Society's money. Okay. I hasten, I hasten to add. So we're going to get kind of a first look at it. Yes, indeed. It's a letter to the Right Reverend the Bishop of Cloyne, and it's concerning the Bishop's treatise on the virtues of tar water. If this is a letter to the Bishop of Cloyne, why is it like a pamphlet? Is it actually a letter to him or is it, it more of a public letter? It's a public letter. It's published as a pamphlet. In fact, it's the second edition from 1744. The first edition had already come out in the same year. It was popular, sold like hot tar water. Who is the Bishop of Cloyne? <laughs> What's the letter? What's going on here? Uh, so George Barclay, Bishop of Cloyne, is pretty well known as a philosopher, but here he's dipping his toes into medicinal waters and it's not going down too well with the medical community led by uh, a gentleman called James Durin. James Durin, a fellow of the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. There's even a picture of him on the wall yep, over there. Yeah, we're so in the room with James, yeah. Two Jameses. Two Jameses, we've got a James holding the camera too. It's almost like he's looking he at us. He is actually looking in this direction, yeah, isn't it? So, so anyway, he's looking at us as we discuss this letter and basically, this is a bit of a dressing down for the bishop, isn't it? That he's well, written. it is. The Bishop of Cloyne has come up with this theory that tar water cures everything. Uh, your next question is going to be, what is tar water? So you boil up pine in yeah. a particular anaerobic way. Don't ask me the, the details on uh, that. Okay. Um, and it sort of infuses into the water. You then drink the water. Okay, and the bishop thought this was a bit of a, a magic substance that yeah, would cure well, everything. It was used in medieval times. It persists into the 19th century. Okay then. So anyway, James Durans put his foot down and said, look, Bishop, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, exactly. Yeah. And this is kind of the letter. It's with great pleasure that I at length send your Lordship my tribute of impartial praise for the benefit mankind in general have received from your treaties on the virtues of tar water. That sounds like nice. It's very, very sarcastic. It's dripping with sarcasm. Okay. Until he um, pulls away the sarcasm in the very final paragraph and just sticks the knife in completely. No one of all that world is more grieved at your misconduct in this affair, this is Durin to Bishop of Cloyne, or more esteems you in your proper character. To conclude in your Lordship's own way of speaking, as Bishop of Cloyne I honour and respect, but as a physician I despise and pity you. Stay in your lane, you're a good bishop, but um, you shouldn't really be dabbling in these medical matters and claiming that this tar water is a universal panacea for everything. It wouldn't at all surprise me if there was a batting back and forth of pamphlets after that and other people leaping in with their pamphlets and a little pamphlet war going on. So distributing pamphlets in those days was a bit like tweeting. That was how you put your idea you out could, there. Yeah, you could put it like that, yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to show you this paragraph. If it be true that he who has discovered a remedy for any one of the diseases our frail bodies are subject to has deserved more of the world than all the heroes that our poets and historians have immortalised, what must be your lordship's praise who has taken this true road to glory and has not stooped down to deliver a remedy for one, but generously given at once a cure for all? Sarcasm alert. You've got some more stuff here to show us which I'm very excited about and is very topical in it's the world. It's extremely the topical, yeah. This, yeah. This is something I've printed out from the online version of our Philosophical Transactions journal and it's during at the end of 1723 encouraging doctors around the kingdom to send in their reports on inoculation, smallpox inoculation. So smallpox is a bit of a problem at this time. Smallpox is uh, extremely um, hazardous, endemic throughout the kingdom. Okay, but it's been realised that inoculation is potentially going to be the uh, the big hope and he wants to do more research on yeah. it. Yeah, inoculation, if your viewers don't know, is just the practice of giving somebody through a little scratch on the arm a sort of controlled dose of smallpox and trying in particular to give it, pass it on from somebody who's, who's got it in the mild form to begin with so that the smallpox comes on after about 10 days but by then your body has learned to, to fight against it and you're not getting it in a wild outbreak. So at this point it's kind of catching on in the UK that this is, you know, we should be doing this. Yeah, Lady Wortley Montague from Constantinople, she was the wife of the British ambassador she wrote saying that the practice was common there you should try that in in Britain and it really caught on in I think about 1721 when members of the royal family were inoculated right successfully they did try it first on some of the death row prisoners at Newgate prison okay just to be on the safe side by this point 1723 it's obviously becoming more and more widespread yeah. and our man James Duran over there looking at us 
is advertising to all the doctors saying, tell us, who are you inoculating? Is it working? Yeah. How are you doing it? It is desired that all physicians, surgeons, apothecaries and others therein concerned will be pleased to transmit to Dr. Durin a particular account specifying the name and age of every person by them inoculated, the place where it was done, the manner of the operation, whether it took effect or no, what sort of distemper it produced, on what day from inoculation the eruption appeared, and lastly, whether the patient died or recovered. Oh, that's yeah. important information. <laughs> he got this volume full of responses. Have a look and at this. And this is Royal Society Classified Papers 23, the inoculations volume. This is the index here at the front, is it? Yeah. So there's quite a few at the beginning from somebody else who was a Royal Society fellow, Claude Amiand. Yeah. Dr. Brady. Dr. Samuel Brady. Samuel Brady's among them there, all right. And then these are the letters. These oh. are the letters, yeah. Oh, goodness gracious, look at that handwriting. I've got mm. no chance. Bit of everything, isn't it? Like yeah, so it's, it's list statistics of who was inoculated. It's very early medical epidemiology, medical statistics gathering. Yeah. Okay. So this is just just letter after letter yeah, coming. Yeah, and there's one Ipswich, October 1724. So doctors have seen this advertisement and have sent in their reports. In this case, from Ipswich. It's good to know that even back then you couldn't read doctors' handwritings. <laughs> Look at this. This is real kind of got lists of numbers and sick, dead. This is more specific. This is not just how many I inoculated. This is like telling little stories about them too. Yeah, so it's talking about the sort of follow-up symptoms after the inoculation. The thing that's interesting about this, Rupert, is how all the different doctors have responded in different ways. Some have oh. given just anecdotes, some have given just lists of numbers, some have given yeah. detailed notes. Some are very statistical, aren't they? Others do it sort of anecdotal ways. And there's still a lot of opposition to smallpox injection inoculation at the time. Oh, well, that sounds familiar. It wasn't absolutely fail-safe. Right. And some people just thought it went against the will of God. God would say whether you got smallpox or not and whether you lived or not. Right. Doctors shouldn't be in there making people ill in the first place. That's not the official position of the uh, Royal Society. <laughs> that is not, particularly yeah. in these times, the official position of the Royal Society. No. <laughs> I gather your arm's still a bit stiff from your uh, I've got, COVID I've, jab. I've, we have both had our jabs, haven't we? We I, have, yeah. I do, I do. I'm very happy to have had mine. Indeed, me too. <laughs> Here we go, look at this. This is St Paul's Parish. And presumably that might be the died column, the second column. Oh yeah, is this the number of people inoculated and then the number of those people who ended up dying? Yeah, that looks slightly higher than sort of 1% or 2% I've been quoting, but... Uh, Perhaps had a bad patch. Yeah. But it was certainly gradually more and more accepted through the 18th century. Of course, that's until vaccination came along at the end of the 18th century, which is much, much safer. Do we know what Durin would have done with all this information? Was some great report or tome written, or was it...? Uh, it does find its way into the philosophical transactions for circulation to fellows and interested readers of the time. So this is volume 32 of the Royal Society's famous journal, The Philosophical Transactions. A letter to the learned Dr. Caleb Coatsworth? Coatsworth. Coatsworth, FRS, of the College of Physicians, London? Yep and physician to St. Thomas's Hospital, containing a comparison between the danger of the natural smallpox, as you said, and of that given by inoculation. By James Durin. By James Durin, all right. M MD, so medical doctor and RS secretary. This must have been, you know, in a day before spreadsheets and things like that, this must have been a, a nightmare for them when this all came in and they had to kind of collate it and turn it into useful information. Yeah, it was, but I think Durin was very good at that sort of thing. Um, he was very strong on his secretarial skills as well as his medical skills. Newton, right. Newton prized him very highly as a secretary. But despite being a numbers man, we've also learned of course, I'll be a bit sarcastic and a bit <laughs> colourful as well. Indeed, yes. All right. The world's most sarcastic fellow. He says, I was seated opposite Professor Daniel, the Foreign Secretary. Professor Daniel had given a lecture at King's College between three and four o'clock. When he came into the society, he appeared in perfect health, but shortly after, his eyes became fixed and his breathing deep and laborious. I exclaimed, Professor Daniel is surely in a fit. And immediately everyone got up to render assistance. His breathing became more and more difficult and there was a great fullness of the vessels of the head. Then with the concurrence of the medical gentleman present, I opened the jugular vein. The blood flowed freely. 